Hello, how are you? <laughs> uh, I don't know about you, but I kind of give up my New Year's resolutions. <laughs> 2025 is my year, though. <laughs> don't worry about it. <laughs> um, first and foremost, I want to thank God for the opportunity to, to be here and share the, the Word of God. It's always an, a privilege, honestly. Um, I think Pastor David said it about two months ago, um, and that actually helped me calm down a lot in my preachings, and he said... Uh, you know, the word that you share, it's not going to change your heart. You're not going to go home and be like, oh, I'm going to change now. You know, it's, it's, it's God who ultimately works in your life, right? And what we do when we preach is just share the gospel, share the word of God, and just kind of constantly remind us of why we serve God, why we follow God, why we walk in his faith. Because we fall from time to time, we fall off from the path, and we all struggle a little bit, and it's not easy. Um, but before I start, I just want to um, share something for the Spanish ministry. It's actually really awesome. It's been a fun week. Um, two people have accepted Christ in the last seven days in our, in our service. And um, today, somebody accepted Christ and dedicated their child to God. So it was, it's been a busy week. Um, I really thank God for that, and I thank for everybody for their prayers and the prayer warriors that are, are here, and they pray for us all the time. And I really thank you, and keep uh, the Spanish ministry in your prayers, please, because God is actually working uh, something big, and I feel something big is coming. Um, we had a lady share the word today, and she was amazing. And you know, and I and I hope that God continues blessing us, right? And thank you, NCFC. You guys have been awesome. Um, the fact that I'm standing up here is testament. <laughs> you guys really do a good job. Um, but today, I saw my uh, name on the schedule, and I and I saw the title, and it says uh, a betrayed priest. And I thought to myself, man, how do we get to the point where you literally have to betray Jesus Christ? It's like, how bad are we? <laughs> and then I was thinking to myself, well, we're some bad people. Because um, I like to consider myself as a good guy, right? I consider myself. But when I read that topic, I was like, all right, this is not an easy one to talk about, but we're going to do it. We're going to get through this together. And it reminded and it took me all the way back to Genesis 3.15, right? It took me all the way back to the beginning. And it says there, and I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. This is a reference to Christ, the son of God, and also the ultimate member of Eve's offspring. You know, Satan will damage Christ, but he will have the ultimate victory on behalf of humanity. Those in Christ will celebrate the victory for him for all eternity. That's a huge promise. I think we'd read that part and we kind of skim through it, but it's a big, big promise. But why was this promise necessary? Well, we all know the story of Adam and Eve. I'm not going to go into details of it. But God created the Garden of Eden, perfection. And he said, Adam and Eve, this is yours, all yours, except for this one tree right here. Every, you have everything. It's, if you read the Bible in Genesis, when he created this beautiful place. And I had to think to myself, I would never mess that up. I would have messed it up the first day, right? And he says, don't do this. And the first thing we do, we listen to serpent, the enemy's voice, they disobey, they betray his trust, and they sin. And it is uh, a definition of betrayal here is, is an act of treachery in which the trust you place in someone is then used against you. The severity of the betrayal is directly related to the closeness of the relationship and the harm done. That's very true. There's no, nothing worse than a family member betraying you or somebody you love. And in this case, it was severe damage, eternal consequence, sin, right? But I don't know about you, if you've ever been betrayed, I've had plenty of experiences, unfortunately. The only one I could really remember vividly that hurt me, and it's a classic story, you know, me and my friend when I was still single, you know, my wife gave me permission to give this story. Um, I really liked this girl, and my friend really liked the girl, too. And of course, you kind of know where this is headed to. We made a promise, look, we're not going to let this girl get between us. I promise. Okay, cool. That's fine. Let's agree. We shook on it, pinky promise, everything. And then a week later, he's dating her. So I'm like, I, I thought we were friends. He's like, well, we weren't that close. I said, I said, okay, I see. I see. I was really upset. That was the worst day of kindergarten for me, right? And it was, uh, <laughs> it was, <laughs> it was a tough week. <laughs> We didn't talk for about two weeks, then we started playing tag again. But being, being betrayed is not something that, you know, it's easy. It's something that really, really hurts you. Um, but betrayal is never fun, right? Uh, but we see this throughout the Old Testament. 
God makes a covenant with all the humans, and we constantly fail him, right? When you carry Adam and Eve, he says, I want to do good throughout the whole world. Join me. They betray him. Then God says, okay, fine. I'm going to send the flood. I'm going to clean this mess. I pick Noah, and let's do this, right? And then Noah goes on with his family. And then what happens? Evil continues throughout the world again, betrayed. All right. God is like, okay. But then along comes Abraham. He makes a covenant with him. And then, of course, Abraham is not patient. He decides to have a child and not wait for God. We all know the story. Once again, impatient betrayal. Then God makes a covenant with the nation of Israel. And I'm not going to go into details with that. We all know the story there. It's failure after failure after failure. But there's so many more examples throughout the Bible about this. And it's constant betrayal after constant betrayal. But there's so many examples that I can go to, but I'm not going to. But then God sends the final covenant, the ultimate covenant, his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the covenantal climax. God already knew that we will betray him constantly. He knew that. He doesn't need us, so to speak. His plan for salvation is moving with us or without us. But then he promised his son, Jesus Christ, to finish that covenant, to, to, to finish that, to close that loop, right? From 1 Peter, this was decided before creation. 1 Peter 1, 18, 20 says, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life, handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. When you read these stories, you think, how can we fail him constantly? Like God spoke to these people. He spoke to them. And you're like, if, God were to, if I were to hear his voice, would I dare betray him? Maybe not in the moment, but, you know, my mom used to give me instructions before she went to, to work. Hey, when you get home from school, take out this meat from the freezer. When I get home, I'm going to cook it. And when she got home, I never took it out the freezer. It was not a fun experience. <laughs> You know, we, we, we like to think, hey, yes, mom, I'm going to do it. Yes, I promise you I'm going to do it. And then when she gets home, we're ordering pizza, right? And I'm crying because she disciplined me. But, <laughs> but, you know, what this shows us is that we're ultimately just weak. We're just weak people. We need a savior. We need somebody stronger than us. We can't, we're not dependable. But this brings me to today's message. It's Matthew 26, 31, 35. There's a lot of reading, I'm sorry. But Jesus predicts Peter's denial. Then Jesus told them, this very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, then Jesus go ahead, goes ahead and quotes the prophecy from Zechariah 13, 7. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And Peter immediately replied, like many of us, jump ahead, right? Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. And Jesus looks at him probably like... Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, that this very night before the roosters crow, you would disown me three times. Not once, not twice, but three times. But Peter declared again, he doubled down, he said, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same thing. Peter is pictured in the Gospels as ever brash and often wrong, just like me. You know, that fearlessness, you know, that everybody knows that person who just speaks their mind, right? I say it because you're thinking it and you don't dare say it, but I will say it. And that, that's me. I, I'm talking about myself. <laughs> I don't know why I'm like that. I'm trying to improve, but it's just how I am. It's just how I'm built. I say what they're thinking because I know they're thinking and I'm brave enough to say it. But Peter, Peter immediately responds to Jesus in this way because he ignores the second part, right? He only focuses on the part of failure, disloyalty, cowardice on his part. And he refuses to accept it or believe it. Peter says, even if everyone else fails you, he throws everybody under the bus. Peter's a great guy, right? I will not fail you. But I don't know about you. I don't like to admit that I'm wrong. Even when I argue with my wife, in my head, I was right. Even though I say you were right, in my head, I was right. I don't like to admit that I'm wrong. I don't know about you. Whoever's married knows that battle. (laughs) 
But we're taught from such a young age to be successful. You, you have to be successful. Success is everything. Failure is unacceptable. Ever since I was a little kid in sports, you can't fail. Be better. Practice. Be better. You cannot fail. It's not acceptable. You're strong. You're not weak. You're constantly told, study, study, study. Get that degree because it's everything. It's everything. Get that money. Get that house. Get... You're constantly told success is everything. But the Bible says otherwise. The Bible really quickly humbles us, right? When you read the Bible, you're like, wait, it doesn't match what I've been taught. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, Indeed, there is no one on earth who is righteous, no one who does what is right and never sins. So we could check that off, right? I never sin. Oh, yes, you do. We all do. 1 John 1.8 says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And then 1 John gets even deeper. It says 110. It says, if we claim we have not sinned, now this is very important, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Now it comes down to my word versus God's word. Like who, who's lying here? I think it's pretty obvious. It's me. Peter says, even if everyone else fails you, I never will. That probably sounded a little insulting to the disciples, right? Like, wait, 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 what do you mean us? Why are you throwing us under the bus? We would like to think that we would never get caught in a situation that we would deny the Lord or his word, right? We would like to think that, right? But the truth is there are times when we do deny him. There are times that we desert Christ to avoid being embarrassed, to shame, or to be, to be identified in Christ. I've been in that, in that situation, we like to hide our emotions, our hurts, our struggles, our obsessions. We don't like to bring them to Christ. You know, hey, Fernando, you okay? You look a little, no, nah, man, I'm good. I'm fine. Don't worry about it. Everything is great. I don't know what it is about us human beings, but we don't like to admit that we're weak. It's just, it's just the truth. It's hard. I don't know if you've ever gone through a problem and you have to admit the problem. It's really difficult. It's really hard to, to admit it, but we hide behind our emotions. You know, you think when you're young, oh, I'm strong enough, I'm young, I have no problems, I have, I'm not married, I have no kids, I have full strength. And if you've been a Christian for 40 years, you're like, oh, I've been in this walk for so long, nothing's going to phase me, nothing's going to bring me down. But then those dark moments come, the reality check. I remember it happened to me when I was 17, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior when I was 17, I remember that vividly. I remember where I was standing, I remember the color of the carpet and everything. And I accepted Christ in my, in my heart. And then fast forward three years, actually four years, I was like, this is easy. I'm in the worship team and the youth group. I'm serving. I'm going here. I'm going there. It's just a piece of cake. I don't know why people are crying at the altar, why people talk to the pastor. For what? Well, it's so weak. That's what I used to say. I was very cocky. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guy. And that's what I thought. I was like, oh, they're so weak. They're always crying. I'm going to play the piano. I'm like, this lady again? Like, every Sunday. It's like, you know. <laughs> but... <laughs> But then in 2004, reality hits, right? I get that phone call, hey, your best friend, which I call my older brother, he died. I'm like, oh. We found him in his bed, and he's not breathing. And I said, oh, man. At such a young age, I was like, oh, man, I know this kid since I was born. And then I said, wow. There goes all that talk. Next Sunday, I was right there. <laughs> it, it was tough. It was tough. That was kind of like a punch to the gut, right? Reality hit. I don't care how young you are. You're going to struggle. The word reminds us of us constantly. We're going to struggle. There's going to be struggles. And I remember for a year and a half, I was really upset. And I did what Peter did. I denied Christ. I was like, why did you let this happen? Why did you let this happen? You're not real. I serve you constantly. And you let this happen. I was pretty upset. Uh, I, well, I thank my wife. She was uh, my girlfriend at the time. Um, but she really helped me through, that, through those moments. And it was tough. It was tough. When th the hard times hit, it really tests your faith. Right? It really tests your faith. But it says, even if I have to die with you, he doubles down, I would never disown you. And all the disciples said the same. But Jesus knows Peter's confidence and his own strength would not be enough in the coming hours. He knew it. Jesus knows we're going to struggle. Jesus knows we're weak. He knows it. It's okay to admit it. It's okay to say, I'm not strong enough. And he says, so truly, Peter, I tell you this very night before the rooster crows, you would deny me three times. But Peter will learn 
eventually something that I hope we all learn, and if you don't remember anything else from this message, I hope you just remember this. It's something that we all need to learn and remember, that Jesus does not want followers who are strong in themselves, but who rely on him and him only. Peter was so sure of himself that he would fight for Christ to the end, to the death. I'm going to fight right next to you. But things do not play out that way, as he imagined, right? He was so confident in his own ability instead of trusting in Jesus Christ. Perhaps we too are confident in our own abilities, right? Physical strength, employment, finances, the know-how, I'm, I'm a genius. But these things won't hold out when those hard times come. All that goes out the window. I respect people with education. I respect people with money. It's fine. It's good. It's good for you. But that's not going to matter when everything gets dark. What's money not going to buy you happiness? It's not. It's not going to fix that problem. But one thing Peter, Peter failed to, to do is listen to the second part of Jesus' statement. He says, but after I have risen, I will go ahead into Galilee. So Jesus was not condemning them. He was just letting them know, hey, I know you're going to fail. There's going to be a lot of suffering but I promise to reunite you. I promise to come back and reunite you. But we fail to sometimes just be quiet and listen to God's word. That's something very important I've learned at the age of 42. <laughs> and 18 years of marriage, I've learned to listen. It's not, it's not easy, but sometimes we just have to be quiet and listen. We are weak, and I'm sorry to say that's just the truth. But 2 Corinthians 12, 9 to 10 is something I love. This is uh, Apostle Paul. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in what? Weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, not for my sake, I delight in weakness in insults, in hardships, in persecution, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. It's kind of hard to understand that. But in our moments of weakness, that's where God shows his strength. I got this from the, from the Bible that I was studying. It's an um, illustration Bible. It's really cool. I'm going to read it to you guys. It says, the Father says, you want me to take away the pain, to solve the problem, to get you out of that situation. But that's not what you need. You need me. And the very problem you're seeking to get away from, the very situation you desire to get out of, is the very one that is causing you to talk to me. Spend time with me and depend on me. You'll be stronger when you're weak because you'll have no other choice than to draw the strength from me. You'll do better when you're weak because you'll have to rely on me and not yourself. Oh, when I read that, I was like, ooh, he's right. He's right. I've had many scares in my life, and I remember... Even my non-believer friends, when they're struggling, hey, can you pray for me, man? Like, like what? You're not, okay. I mean, sure. I just, it's just weird when they say it because they're non-believers, and it's okay. But, but the first thing people do is like, oh, God, if, you're, if you exist, please help me. I'm like, what do you mean, if you exist? Um, but confidence in ourselves is very dangerous because it will lead to the next step, which is lack of prayer, lack of communication. Matthew 26, 36 to 46 says, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called, I'm going to say in Spanish, I can't say this word, Hetsemane. And then he said to them, sit here while I go over and, and pray. He took Peter and two sons of Zebedee, he ch chose Peter, along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet at, not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned, and he found his disciples praying. Oh, was it, was it praying? What did it say? Sleeping. Yeah, I can identify with that, too. Um, couldn't you men keep watch for one hour, he asked Peter? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Sure is. He went away for a second time and prayed, My father, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and he went away once more and prayed for a third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come 
and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go, here comes my betrayer. Instead of praying with Jesus, Peter and his disciples were sleeping. They were just, I, when I read that, I'm like, man, like you have Jesus with you. He tells you to do something and you fall asleep. Like, man, it just, again, just shows you how weak we can be. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebediah with him and said, stay watch. Stay watch. He said, my soul is overwhelmed. And then Jesus practices was in Psalm 55, 22. He says, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. Going a little further, he fell to his face and prayed. But what happens when he comes back? The disciples again are sleeping. How sad is that? But I'm guilty. I fell asleep many times. The story of my family, uh, my wife's family member tells us this story. He said that everybody came up to pray at the church. The pastor was like, come here if you have needs. Everybody came up. He got on his knees and started praying. And then something happened. He woke up and the service is over. He had fallen asleep. He was still kneeled down and there. People thought that he was in deep prayer, but he was actually knocked out. I was like, I was like, oh my goodness. I don't know how embarrassing that would be, but man, to come up with prayer and fall asleep and everybody's eating donuts is like, all right. But, you know, it just shows you how weak we can be, right? Oh, and he was like 15 years old, by the way. Um, but then he asked him again. He adds a little bit more. He says, watch and pray so that we will not fall into temptation. He said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You're reminding him again, the flesh is weak. James 1, 3 to 14 says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. By your own evil desire. God doesn't force you to, to sin. He doesn't want you to sin. I don't like that thinking like, oh, God is making me do this. God made me fall. No, God didn't make you do anything. It says here, by your own evil desire, not his. God doesn't tempt us. We tempt ourselves. Don't blame God. I know I did. And it's a very dangerous thing to do. Then Jesus went away for a second time and he prayed. When he came back, he again found them sleeping once again. They weren't thinking about how they needed God in their lives. They weren't thinking about Jesus and his struggles and how he was hurting in that moment. They weren't thinking about that. They were just thinking, you know what, I'm sleepy. Yeah, I'm going to sleep. They knew what was going to happen. Jesus had told them already. But even if he told them, they, they still fell asleep. Again, just weak. Constantly just failing. But then confidence in ourselves brings a proud slumber upon, upon us, right? We, we neglect the humble reliance upon God that we need from him day to day. That's a very dangerous walk. When everything is okay in our lives, it's like, God, I got it. You can take a break. Take a week off. Don't worry about it. I got this. It's all good. And the question is, are we still depending on our own strengths? Like, how do I know if I'm depending on my own strength? Well, how's your prayer life? How's your relationship with Jesus Christ? Are you constantly seeking for his presence, for his word? That's how you know if you're depending on yourself or on God. Every decision I make, am I running through to God first? Is this something you want in my life? Is this what you want me to do? I love this phrase, watch and pray so that you will not f fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Galatians 5.16 says, but I say walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. It's a constant battle between good and evil. It's that constant battle daily deciding to walk with Christ or decide things on my own. It's just a constant battle that we have to fight. It's not easy. I admire those people that get up at five in the morning to pray. I'm trying to work towards that, but it's, it's hard. Getting up at five in the morning to pray. I can't even get up at five in the morning to watch TV. Imagine praying. It's, it's, it's tough. It's tough. But starting your day with Christ is very key, very important, right? It's that communication. That first person that you speak to is God. Here I am. Bless this day. What do you have for me this day? Thank you for this day. It just changes your life. It changes your life. And when we pray, we, cannot, we can come to God with our raw emotions, right? We can come to him and un unload our feelings. Jesus shows that when he prays to his father. He wasn't shy. 
He said it himself. He says, I am sorrowful and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed, but sorrow to the point of death. I mean, that statement in itself is pretty deep. It says to the point of death. I mean, just imagine what he was going through at that moment. Something so difficult. When I read the part of the Bible, it's really tough. Because I can't imagine what he was feeling. Because right then and there, he was going to head the path to the cross. First time he prayed, he said, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Second time, my father, if it is possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it. The third time, saying the same thing. Luke 22, 44 expands a little bit more. and says, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. How stressed do you have to be to go? There's a scientific term for that. I can't remember what it is, but it's a real thing. Like, where you have so much stress and anxiety that you can literally sweat blood. And that's what Jesus was going through. People are like, oh, the Bible is fake. The Bible is not real. Oh, it's real. It's 100% real. Trust me. But don't pray. Um, don't be afraid to pray with those emotions. Don't be afraid. Some people teach you like, oh, you have to be respectful. Yes, respect God. Yes, don't blame him. But you can come to him and tell him, I'm struggling. This is hurting me. I can't do this. You know why? Because he already knows it. He already knows what you're going through. But it feels so good when you speak it. I don't know about you, but it just feels like something is lifted when you express something so much, and you're like, ah, I feel better. That's why I enjoy worship. Like, when you're worshiping, I was just sitting in the front, I'm like, ah, it's just beautiful. I love music. I thank God that he gave us music. It's just worship is just something different. When you tell Jesus, I can't, I can't, I can't, you're admitting your weakness, and that's okay. Because that's when God will start to lift you up. That's when God will start to show you his, his strong hand. But Jesus ends every prayer as we should end every prayer. And I love this part. It says, yet not as I will, but as you will. In other words, your will be done, not mine. That's very important. We like to ask, we like to think God is a genie. You rub the lamp, he comes out, hey, I need this, get it done. It's like, whoa, time out. It's a constant reminder once again, it's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about my plans. It's not about your plans. It's about his plans. It's his will, not mine. God has a plan for salvation for all humanity. We just need to trust in his plan. Walk with him in spirit. Jesus went went to the cross trusting in that plan, fully trusting in that plan. I don't know about you, but I would have given up right there and then and said, you know what? Nah, this is not for me. Luckily, it wasn't me you had to depend on, right? It was Jesus Christ. But it wasn't easy. He fully trusted in the Father till death, literally. It's not about what I want to do, and that's something hard to admit because as a father, as a husband, I make a lot of decisions. You know, I make a lot of decisions where we go, what vacation we do, what house we're going to live in. I, of course, I consult with my wife. But it's, it's constant. This, you're used to making decisions on this earth, but when you come to the Father and you say, your will be done, not mine, you're fully giving everything to God, and you're trusting him. I have trust issues, but, you know, it's not easy. It's not easy trusting in the Father. But Matthew 26, 47 to 56 says, While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd, armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief and priest of the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man, arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, do what you came for, my friend. Then the man stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that one, uh, with that, one of Jesus' uh, companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put the sword back in its place, Jesus said. For all who draw the sword will die by sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father? And he will at once put a disposal, more than 12 legions of angels. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that I say it must happen this way? In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, am I leading a rebellion that you have to come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching and you did not arrest me. 
But this, but this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Once again, he's denied, betrayed Christ. I will die if I have to. I will never betray you. And the first thing he did was flee. When everything gets dark, when everything gets hard, first thing we do, we get scared. I grew up in New York City. I remember the first time I got punched in the face, sorry. I got up and I told this kid, I forgot what I told him. We were arguing about something and I was really cocky. And he just punches me. I tell you, I remember the feeling. I don't remember what I said, I remember the feeling. It was in the middle of class too, in front of everybody. I felt so embarrassed, I felt so weak. I was like, oh man, what do I do now? He's bigger than me. I was a, I was a skinny little kid. This guy was, I don't know what I was thinking. I, I don't know, I, I'm crazy. It explains a lot of my issues, right? But, um, but he just punched me in class and I was like, oh man, I didn't know what to do. I had no idea. And I think about Peter, it's like, yeah, I would never do that. When the time came, Oh, yeah, Jesus was right. Yeah, I'm out of here. Um, but Jesus demonstrates the opposite, right? He, ex- he exercises restraint. He says, do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then will the scriptures be fulfilled that say I m- it must happen this way? Jesus says, you think I need you? You think you're strong enough? I have a father who could send 12 legions of angels. He could have done that at any moment in his life, but he didn't. He remained faithful every single step of the way. Where we constantly fail, Jesus succeeds. He did it for us. He died for our sins, and he trusting in the Father every step of the way. And every time I read this Bible verse, I think to myself, man, thank you. Thank you. So stop trying to be brave. Don't think you're strong enough. Submit to God. Give everything you have to him. What does that look like? It's just trusting in him, reading his word, reading his promises, reading what he has in store for us. We get so caught up in the everyday life, in my career, in my job, my family, and we lose sight of the ultimate promise. It's salvation. We're on this earth temporarily. I like to tell you, Father Time has, is undefeated. Not even LeBron James could beat him. I know LeBron James is playing to the age of 50, but I think eventually he will pass away too, like all of, all of us. We need to learn to trust in Jesus Christ and what he has. Go live your life. Go work, earn money. It's okay. Have, have children, get married. It's okay. But don't forget about the ultimate promise, salvation. And working in the Spanish ministry has been life-changing. It's been life-changing watching people struggle, hearing the stories of how you come across that border with your kids. The lady who accepted Christ has been here for a month. She had a son who was about to turn two. They came through the border with her little kid. I was like, oh, man, that's, that's tough. That's tough. And you get humbled real quick because she says, I was just trusting in God. I was like, oh. I'm over here thinking, man, I don't know what to eat. My struggles, oh, what am I going to eat? Cross a whole border through Mexico, that's crazy. She said, every step of the way, I just think, like, God has something better for me and for my little child. I was like, man, my problems become like this? You can't even see them. It's like, wow. Give everything to Christ. None of this matters. Peter failed to listen to the second part of the message. I will come back. I will reunite. I will will die. Peter, chill. Like, I'm trying to tell you something. Listen to what God is trying to tell you. Hebrews 9.28 says, So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time. Here's the promise. He will appear a second time. Not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him for those who are waiting for him. That right there opens up my eyes and I'm like, man, am I waiting for Christ? Am I living for Christ? Again, it's not, it's, and it's a, we had this debate with our Bible study group, it's like, it's not about what you do, right? Because you're already saved by grace. 
So don't fall into that trap like, oh, I have to read 10 verses a day. No, 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 no. It's a relationship. When you fall in love with somebody, you give them your heart. You open up your heart to them. You trust them fully with all your secrets. Everything that you have, you tell them. My wife knows everything about me. I don't like to admit that, but she knows everything about me. She could really destroy me if she wanted to. She knows everything about me. But I trust her because I love her. I completely trust her. That's the relationship you need to have with Jesus Christ. Hey, look, I'm struggling with this. Hey, look, I need this. I, I, I can't anymore. You can cry. You can scream. You can yell. Whatever you have to. Trust in Jesus Christ. Give him everything. Because the promise is that he's coming back again. And that's a message that we rarely hear, because you usually hear about love, and it's okay, you know, so, you know, love and parenting, it's okay. But God has put in my heart to remind the church that he is coming back. You look around the world, all the wars, all the earthquakes, all the flooding, all the, I don't even turn on the TV sometimes, I don't even want to look at it. It's crazy. And then you remember the promises, God will come back. Why do you allow so much suffering just trust in me. Trust in the plan. There's a plan I'm working here. Trust, trust, trust. Keep working. Uh, I can invite the worship team up. But the question, church, is are we waiting for him? Or are we like the disciples? Are we sleeping? And that's a little forward, I know. I apologize. I wish I could be a little more kinder. Um, I guess it's in my nature. But that's a legit question. Like, are we waiting in him? Are we waiting for him? Are we walking with him? Or is he going to find us sleeping? The time has come, Jesus said. The time has come. The time is now. It says, are we praying so we didn't fall into temptation? Or are we asleep falling for every temptation that comes our way? That is very key. You pray to God to stay away from temptation. Because once you don't pray, once you don't seek his presence, once you don't walk with him, you start to depend on yourself. And that's when we fall. That's when we fail. It's not about me. It's about God's plan. When God called Noah, Abraham, David, all these great people, it wasn't because he needed them specifically. He could have done that with anybody. He chose those people, and we know the stories. They failed constantly. It was craziness. But he used them to carry out the plan of salvation, eventually leading to Jesus Christ on that cross, dying for your sins, my sins. And if you're not a believer, the Bible says he loved the world so much, the entire world, not just believers. He died for everybody. So don't feel lonely. Don't feel like, oh, God is only speaking to these people. And no, God is speaking to you as well, too. And when I see people accept Jesus Christ, it's a beautiful thing. And if you're thinking about it, if you're like, ah, should I, should I not? It's a beautiful thing. It will change your life. It's not going to be easy. It might even get harder. But it's a beautiful thing because you learn to trust in somebody else that will never fail you. And that's the promise that God has for all of us, whether you're a believer or not a believer. But he will come back one day for all of us. He will re reunite all of us. So I challenge you this week to think about it. How's my relationship? Remember, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. It's not what, about what I do, it's about my love between me and my Savior. It says the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Don't get caught sleeping. It's time to wake up. It's amazing what we have. Yeah, it's a beautiful church, big church. It's good. It's amazing. Work hard for it. But don't focus on these things. Because Jesus is coming back. How is your heart? How is your heart? I don't know about you, but I don't want to get caught sleeping. That's something very dangerous. I know I fall off from time to time. And when I was younger, I think, oh, man, I'm not at church. Oh, I just messed up. I'm glad he didn't come at this moment. Like, no, it's not about what he catches you doing in the moment. It's about your walk with Christ daily, daily. And there's constant struggles. We've heard struggles of, of brothers and sisters in the church. So lately, we've heard a lot of bad news. It's going to happen. But this is when we all come together as a church and we pray for each other. We come closer to Christ in the time of need and we look for him. But the hardest thing to do is to look for him when nothing is happening. That's the hardest thing to do. 
when everything is okay, it's not easy to go seek him because you already have what you need. I thank God because I grew up dirt poor. I ate cereal with water. Cockroaches in my cereal. Yes. Pick them off and eat. That's what my parents told me. If you don't eat the cereal, you don't have food. All right, fine, whatever. I ate that food, it's okay. But I thank God for that because it taught me so many lessons. Fully depend on God. I thank my mom for that. She always taught me that lesson. One day, you'll make it. It's okay. God's got a plan for your life. Don't worry about it. But in the meantime, pray. Get close to him. Love him. Seek him. No matter what. And that's what I'm challenging the church this week. Think about that. How is my walk with Christ? Is he going to catch me sleeping? I hope not. I hope not. Jesus Christ sacrificed everything. His only son for you and me. Let that resonate for a little bit. His son came here. Flesh, just like you and me. Felt all that pain like you and me. All that stress like you and me. But what did he do? He prayed. He trusted in his father. He said it. Ah, I have so much pain. So much pain. He spoke expression. It's one thing about the Latino culture that I love. He carried away with it sometimes, but this expression. Expression, 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 expression. Just saying the words, I can't, I'm weak. That's enough. And then from there, you'll start to see God's miracles and God working in your life, I promise you. It's okay. And as a Latino man, they always teach you, men don't cry. You're strong. Yeah, that's a lie. I told my kid, you can cry whenever you want. It's okay. Let it out. Jesus got it. I'm going to ask you to stand if you don't mind. As we work with so many people in Spanish ministry, <laughs> constantly see God's favor. You see his miracles at work. The things that people go through is crazy. But even in those bad moments, you start to see how God saves people. You start to see how God comes through. Don't be like Peter and just focus on the negativity. Oh, the Bible says I'm going to struggle. The Bible, but Jesus, you love me. I gave you my life. I serve you. But why does it say I'm going to struggle? Because it's going to happen. Because that's when God is the strongest in your life. And I love the song that you're going to sing today. God is so good. I don't remember that part. I wish I did. Yeah, I think something along the lines of this world will bring suffering. But in that moment, I will remember what Calvary has done for me, for now and forever. What Jesus did on the cross is not temporary. It wasn't for that era. It wasn't for them only. It's for everybody until the end of time. Whether you're a believer, I encourage you to continue strengthening your walk with Christ. And if you're not a believer in here today, I encourage you to get to know him. Ask anybody in this church. We all are humans. We all struggle no matter what. But Jesus Christ is everything and he is enough. We can sing this song together.